Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I'm just trying to fucking work this out. Do you need any help? Because um, I'm really um, prepared. I've got my <laughs> phone. I've got my little mic. Uh, and, and, and then I have to have the headphones. What do I do then? You, you've done it correctly. I haven't. <laughs> I hate Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's nice to be able to see you. Oh, okay. Your lovely... Kind eyes. Fuck, that's what they'll put on my tombstone. He had kind eyes. <laughs> Can't say much about the guy, but he had kind eyes. The moon in the night sky with pale eyes and pale skin and long hair covering her naked body. Do you have like a um, instrument there, Warren, that you can, a piece of intro music? Yeah, I've kind of. don't need to do an entire concert just play like three seconds and then i'll say something and and uh well, are you ready all right yeah here we go hey g'day nick hey warren we're doing a uh an interview to celebrate that album carnage our, our album and our fans uh, have sent in a number of fabulous questions questions yeah really inspired so I guess we just pick them out at random um, yeah. and see what happens. And sometimes she's laughing and sometimes she's crying and sometimes the moon is talking to nobody. So there's one here that come, I can see. Is Warren the Yoko Ono of the band who caused you to split from the rest of the bad seat? <laughs> Shahed uh, Ashraf has asked that question. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find it a bit insulting, actually, that because Yoko Ono is awesome and I'm clearly not. Well, we, I'd, I'd also like to say here the best thing that Yoko Ono ever did was break up the Beatles. Look at what happened after that. They were a band in decline and Yoko Ono stepped in and, and allowed everyone the freedom to go on to make some really beautiful records, John Lennon and the other guy. How familiar are you with the all Beatles catalogue? All Things Shall Pass, that guy. George Harrison. George Harrison, beautiful record. Yeah, and Ringo did Photograph. What a beautiful song. But, but just on that question, first of all, the Bad Seeds haven't split up. Right? We're still The Bad Seeds have always been something that morphs into different forms and and there's there's the lineup changes all the time it always has changed all the time i think what shahid might be saying is that did you cause blixer bargeld and mick harvey to leave the band i've actually asked mick harvey that question i don't think that that's true i asked him that question and he said clearly and blixer too you know i mean i still break bread with blixer when he comes to paris and stuff like that so clearly there's not a problem but I, I think the question is more is that what made you break away from the rest of the band per se maybe like why we tend to work together more these days well well that, that there's there's another question i think there about what we find valuable in each other if the devil's in the details what specifically do you each admire wonder or wonder become confounded by in each other Macarla in Vancouver. Yeah, I mean, for me, in regard to our creative part, apart from you just being my very dear friend, there's all sorts of things that are in the detail. Within that, but, but in the details of that friendship, but as a working partner, I feel that the ideas that I have are just made a lot better when I collaborate with you. We drove through the hills with the moon in our eyes. We bought a house in the country where we could lose our minds. I mean, I can sit at the piano and write a song, perfect, perfectly capable of doing that on my own, but it's a certain type of song that, that, that is limited by what I can do musically. Like, you know, I sit and play something on the piano and sing it. It becomes a certain type of song. Not even remotely surprised. When I step back from that type of songwriting and allow you in, the songs just go anywhere. She's waving goodbye, she's waving goodbye. Well, the moon is a girl with the sun in her eyes. In that respect, 
our relationship as a collaborative team is not like the other uh, relationships within other members of the Bad Seeds historically. There definitely seemed a point, I think, when we started working together where you, there was a, a definite feeling of freedom melodically that you had also, where you weren't just bound by chords yeah. that you had already and, and melody, and, and that would also inform the lyric writing as well because you wanted to fall within a certain melody and stuff like that. Whereas it seemed when we started picking up, you know, I'd just start up an idea and you would just ad lib over the top and you can sense that freedom in the ideas that have come out of there. When I sit and play the piano, I can't improvise and sing because I know what's going to happen when my hands press certain keys. I just know where it's going to go. When I'm singing to music that we're doing together, I don't know where it's going. You feel that sense of you wondering what's, where it's going to go and waiting that you just never get when you come in with constructed yeah, it's impossible. melody it's and chords. Yeah, so you, you're actually, it's this incredible risk taking. And, and I think in the audience, you feel that because you don't know where you're going and they're with you. So everybody has no idea where it's going and you're all just floating. I think that's some of the reason why we move into a more ambient kind of thing sometimes because that lends itself to that sort of um, experimentation whereas basic rock and roll songs don't really do that in the same way she's waving goodbye the moon is a girl the sun when i met you you know in the mid 90s immediately you encouraged me to just be myself in a way like go, go as far as i wanted to go and you've always done that with me and i've always found that incredibly creative in the studio and still you know to this day I find that when we get in the studio is something there's an incredible amount of trust and risk taking that, that comes into play but that willingness to kind of take it as far as possible and I've always found that creatively really encouraging yeah and it's that that is a, a trust issue it's in yeah you know it's, it's a trust issue because we very much allow each other, the room to do things that don't work. Yeah. The creative act is very much about opening yourself up and exposing yourself and you're very vulnerable. Yes. If you're making music with someone you feel that, that it would be judging you in some way about that kind of thing, it's almost impossible to do. Yeah, it's a strange sort of counterpoint of vulnerability and being audacious at the yeah, same time. Exactly. That you have to kind of be prepared to jump, but you also, there's a, there's a, a real vulnerability about it. Yeah, uh, it's that idea of the best thing within a friendship is that the friendship makes you a better person, whether whether that's creatively or in in other ways. But I feel that our create our collaboration certainly makes me a better musician. You know, there's also that thing I've noticed that um, you're one of the few people I can sort of sit at the table with now and not really talk to, and I find it really. <laughs> comfortable like I can talk to you of course you know but I find it really comfortable because we just spend hours and hours literally at, we have spent you know like I mean so many hours together sitting in this for me is a really kind of sacred moment when we go in the studio and sit down yeah. like it's really a moment that nothing else in my life does that it's really sacred to me that that moment and there's a sort of when you have days and days on end of that kind of sense of wonder and, 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 and amazement and absolute disbelief or like, God, this is terrible or whatever. It renders normal conversation sometimes rather flaccid and, and you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel very comfortable just sitting with you in silence. And I think that's part that's of it. That's not true because we like talk all the time. For really, yeah. for really, really long <laughs> periods of time. You tell me I never bloody call you. So I'm, no, I you, I'm... you don't ever call me. I always call you. Well, I always have my phone on silent. Yeah. I mean, you notice I do. You're one of the people I only that I'll answer to or I call back. You don't I, answer my phone. You call back. Again. Yeah, I see that you've called and I call back. I, I think it does me good. It keeps me in the real world that you don't answer me back because when you become famous, 
one thing people do is ring back. They answer the phone. That's one, one of the things that I noticed changed in my life. By keeping you real. Yeah, you're keeping it real by not answering the fucking phone. <laughs> Do you want me to ask you a question about your lyrics, Nick? There seem to be a, f a few here. You know, here's one here. What primary explanation would you give for the 200 pounds of packed ice metaphor in the Balcony Man song? Does it in any way relate to the suppressed feeling caused by the virus? Ah. That's from Zephyr Zwin. Well, uh, 200 pounds of packed ice is a metaphor that's migrated across from uh, White Elephant. And White Elephant has a toppled statue metaphor going on. And in fact, the, that comes out in other songs too. In White Elephant, the toppled statue becomes an ice sculpture. The ice sculpture is made of elephant sized tears or, or elephant tears. And, and elephant tears for me are tears to do with memory, as in the memory of an elephant. So basically, the 200 pounds of packed ice, I think, is referring to me sitting on the balcony, melting with memory. What am I to believe? I'm the balcony man. That has something to do with the virus in the sense that this you can't get away from the fact, or at least lyrically, that this record was written in a pandemic. The, the thing that, that happens in this record to me is that the central character is unable to move and is just sitting in this one place, but with, with an imagination that's, that's um, constantly traveling. I'm 200 pounds of packed ice sitting on a chair in the morning sun. Putting on my tap dancing shoes or my lap dancing shoes in the morning sun. I'm the balcony man, I'm Fred Astaire. You think you have a plan until I hit the stairs. I'm a 200 pound bag of blood and bone leaking on your favorite chair. And I like White Elephant a lot too, um, because I was really happy with that lyric. That, that lyric is the poem that I wrote for Thomas Hausago to get him to start painting. Did Thomas Hausago's painting ever make it out of customs? Deirdre wants to know. Uh, yes, Bell. yeah, two. two. There were two uh, paintings. And um, so th there's a story on the Red Hand Files where he had a psychic serious psychic breakdown thomas and uh, came out of it but uh, unable to paint and so we had a phone conversation and i think he was in malibu at the time where he sort of found a place to live uh, away from everyone while he kind of got it got himself together but he couldn't paint and uh, uh, but i was yeah having my own problems uh, and i and i said well, i'll write you a song if you paint me a picture and that became a way to kickstart stuff for me and and for him too. But he told me later on recently that he was like, yeah, yeah, all right, I'll do that. But when he got off the phone, he was quite taken aback by my lack of, um, he felt that I wasn't taking his collapse seriously enough. You know, that that of course he couldn't paint. You know, can't don't you know what I've been through and all of this sort of stuff he was quite angry by the phone call and that he went out walking and Malibu had burnt down again in one of their, you know, and it, it was, it was just this sort of desolate place that he was walking through and he walked and he saw this one purple flower that had sort of sprung through the, uh, through the carnage. And, and he being a, like a painter and everything saw this very symbolically and, thought, all right, there's the picture, I'll paint that flower. And, and he, he painted that flower, and, it's, it's, it, and it did get through customs, and it's now in my house, and it, it's, it's really an incredibly beautiful flower. And that did, that did start uh, an extraordinary series of paintings that he's done, and that, that he just exhibited in, in Belgium, and that got incredible response from people. So, yeah, so it did get through customs, two paintings. The white hunter sits on his porch With his elephant gun and his tears 
shoot you for free if you come around here. That was so that was initially just a poem that I said into the mic in between songs. Protest kneels on the neck of a statue. The statue says I can't breathe. Protester says now you know how it feels and he kicks it into the sea. And then when I came in in the morning, you'd stayed back and stuck it on top of that um, beat. And it was just fucking awesome. I just sat there going, you know, oh my God, you know, it's like, the, the, the beautiful thing about it is that I didn't perform that song to the beat. If I had performed that song to a beat and a driving thing that it is, I would have, it wouldn't have that kind of soft, lazy sort of feel that the uh, contemptuous sort of feel that the vocal yeah, you would have has. leaned into it more yeah it would have pushed much more yeah, so i really this. love the restraint of the, the vocal against the drive of the, the music with my elephant gun of tears i'll shoot you all for free eva frajola what a lovely name. Eva would like to know which lake in Africa, Nick. Oh, that's uh, Lake Malawi. It's, it's one of Susie's stories uh, where she grew up in Africa. And uh, she tells a story of, as a very young child, three years old or something like that, being tossed out of a boat in Lake Malawi in order to swim to the other boat um, to teach her to swim. So that's a kind of trapped memory. But, but I, I always really liked that that little story, that idea of being being sort of um, swimming between two things. This is a question for me, actually. Just to, so are all your lyrics that kind of? I would have just thought you said like in Africa, because for some reason. But the, 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 a lot of your songs have like meaning, like a, a line like that. I, I wouldn't have thought there was some. I just wouldn't have, it would never have dawned on me that there was a story attached to it. Well, there's a story, but there's also the metaphor and, and it's the, a child swims between two boats. Yeah. But between two strong things that there's a child swimming in the middle of it. You know, that, that has all sorts of resonances for me. But basically, you know, it's just, I think, sitting in bed, right? This morning crawls towards us. Towards us, yeah. With a, me with a memory in its paws or something like that. With a memory in its paws. Child swims between two boats. Her mother weaving from the shore. Darling. You know, then it, then it becomes literally a song about, uh, I think, about not being able to go anywhere. Oh, that lake in Africa. Well, I think the lyric came out of an, a, a, an improvised thing that we'd done in the studio with that particular song and with that, that chorus line. You know, we won't get to Albuquerque any time. We, we won't get to anywhere, darling, any time this year, which was just a beautiful uh, line with a beautiful... Beautiful melody. Sometimes you sing a, a line with a particular melody and, and the line may not even be that good or, or that thought out, but it's simply, in, in, you can't separate it from the melody. We won't get to anywhere, darling. And that was very much like that. Remember we tried all sorts of things on that Yes, line. we did, yeah. Yeah, we tried moving it around and adding parts to it. And... In the end it became Al Albuquerque because in my mind, that was um, part of, you know, the, uh, by the time I get to Phoenix, um, the second verse of that is by the time I get to Albuquerque, you'll be working. And, and it feels like this record, one of the things about Carnage is it feels like uh, somebody else's song to me, that kind, kind of uh, old country and Western style of traveling and moving and throwing your bags in the back of the car and motels and by the time I get to Phoenix on the radio and all of this sort of stuff, felt that it had a, um, a 
a feeling which I talked to you about before we went into yeah. Africa of making a record that was that kind of uh, big themed Jimmy Webb classic um, kind of yeah like a rainy night rainy nights in, in Georgia or whatever that kind of um, big classic big themed heartbreak kind of stuff um, and so weirdly even though Carnage is not even remotely like that kind of a record there are these sort of residual themes that keep running through each song i find i never talked to you about that anyway yeah well it's i i don't write much that i don't uh, um, that i'm not personally connected to you know that it has to feel that way for me sometimes i'm not sometimes you know there's a, a line goes into a song that you're not connected to but it just sort of sounds good and you let it go but I find those songs always come back to haunt you. But they're probably they're only haunting you. They're not they're not haunting anybody else. Yeah, but I, I see them coming. You know, I, I see them coming in a song. I'm playing a song and singing it. And... Yeah, I, I know those I've, over the years of working with you. I know those things where you you sort of just wince when you hear a thing, yeah. and when we're listening, and then you go like, oh. I, I've got to do something about that. Well, I mean, it's something also just to say anyone out there trying to write songs, it's always tempting to, you know, you always find yourself putting song, putting lines from other people's songs or poetry or whatever. They find their way into your songs. And that's just part of the process of songwriting. But, but it's worthwhile weeding them out, you know, because even though they might sort of sit well and no one's going to know anyway and all the rest of it, I find they cause too much aggravation in the end. I never really understood when you kind of, I mean, I now I get it. it. Is Carnage sort of a part two of, or continuation of The Carney by Kay Twombly? Uh, well, no. No. Not intentionally, I would say, not intentionally. What is, your, what is yours and Warren favorite song of Carnage and why, Susanna Correa? Uh, wants to know what's your favorite song on carnage i have two lavender field and the song carnage i heard lavender field the other day and, and it was by chance somewhere on the radio or something that really kind of moved me so i'd say lavender field Travelling appallingly alone On a single road Into the lavender fields That reach high beyond the sky What about this one? Here's one for you. Just this will piss you off, no doubt. Another cobbled together, half-assed, lockdown, lo-fi compromise. That was my first thought upon first listen. Then I listened again and felt compelled to listen another time. And then again, then the genius emerged. This is a familiar dance with your music. That's why it endures. It's a reverse narcotic. Will you merge Carnage into Ghostine for the tour from Great Biggie? Great Biggie. <laughs> I think it's Great Big Gig. Great Big Gig. Oh, yeah. Do you have a, do you have a response to that? <laughs> uh, no. Does, well, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I think both Ghostine and Carnage on uh, first listen to a lot of people, they didn't like those records. You know, they really felt that, they were a step too far away from what they, you know, their expectations around what a Bad Seeds record should be. But I think they really gained traction on repeated listens and people just came to really love those records. And I get that message that this great big gig has said uh, a lot. After Carnage came out, I was worried, you know, it's difficult to make a record that you know is going to divide people. 
you worry for the community? Well, I, I just don't. I mean, I think it's our duty to divide people. That's part of what keeps our music alive and what keeps it inter interesting. But it's also difficult to do, to lose fans, you know, to do something where you lose fans. And I was worried that that would, you know, that that might be the response on some level. And when I when I looked at the red hand files in the, the following morning, because there had been some bad stuff going on that night or something like that, I can't really remember why, but there was something that made me very nervous about how people would receive carnage. And then I looked at, it was sat down in the morning and made a cup of coffee and opened up the red hand files questions and there was just this incredible support for the record it was really incredibly moving to read but there were but but there were, occasionally there were i'm sorry this is just too far you've lost me on this one don't like just don't like this record um so there so there was a little Bring bit of that Blitzer. but essentially there was a, a great love for carnage when it came out do you have any feelings about that? I find it more terrifying when people would just say, oh, it's like the last record. That to me is way more terrifying than someone saying, I fucking don't get it or I hate it. Or I, I personally would rather to push beyond what last came out and not procrastinate to just keep moving until we get in a room and find that there's just nothing happening. And then yeah. I think we have, that's when we'll have to look at what's going on between us, you know, like, and that hasn't happened yet, but when it does, then we'll know what to do with that. Like I remember hearing, here comes the warm jets when it came out. I took it back to the record store because I just couldn't afford to spend that much money on a record that I didn't like. And it's now like one of my favorite records ever. Like, I love that record. I think I've, I find a record I find difficult at first, but takes a while with me, eventually becomes this. Warren, you've gone away? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Something is going on with my fucking sound. Like, it just keeps cutting. I don't know what happened. You need to have your little mic on. Okay, so I put on, and I, then I put on, how do I do You've got to go into Nexus? settings. Or the technical one. You've got to go into settings. I say it is yes. a and go on to voice memo. Okay. And the and lavender is stained my skin. And it made me strange. The lavender is tall and reaches beyond the heavenly. I plow through this furious world of which I'm truly over. Warren, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan wants to know, is the unique layout of the title Carnage on the cover meant to highlight C-A-E for Cave and Alice? Uh, I haven't heard that one. I would say no. No, I mean there there are the, the red letters, you know, the highlighted letters are of great personal significance. But um it's a secret. Keep something for yourself. Keep some things back. I just don't think the world is quite ready to hear what that actually means. I I will reveal that in a year's time. Uh, on this day in a year's time uh and and the world will be shocked to its core. <laughs> I, I want to ask you another one, Nick, actually. I like this one. In Italy, someone defined Carnage as apocalyptic, as an, an apocalyptic record. And in my opinion, he is right. What is apocalypse for you? I believe that apocalypse does not mean only the possibility that everything will end, but also that in reality, there is a meaning beyond appearance, a hope. What do you think about it? Paolo Bergamo, Italy. Okay, well, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a really beautiful question. If you're talking about apocalypse as a catastrophe, I mean, apocalypse has a bunch of meanings, but as a catastrophe, I think we're experiencing them all the time uh, on a personal level. And it's through those catastrophes that the, gro the growth happens. 
I always seem to be saying goodbye and rolling through the mountains like a train. My uncle's at the chopping block, turning chickens into fountains. I'm a barefoot child watching in the rain. I don't mean that it's good that we had a pandemic. That stepped into this song, taken a bow, and stepped right out again. But what I'm trying to say is that I hope through the pandemic that we rise out of out of this I'm as better people. And I think that this happens with our own personal calamities as well, that we have the capacity to be able to rise out of them. Uh, and improve ourselves in the process. I, I understand that. The, the record feels to me that it is embedded in a catastrophe of some sort. I don't think that you can listen to Carnage and not feel that at some point. There it comes around again. But I, I am not ever interested in writing hopeless songs. All our songs that we always do are hopeful. They may be coming out of disasters and they may be coming out of sorrows and things like that, but they're always, there's always an upward trajectory to, towards the songs. And I hope to see you again. So it's always hopeful, always hopeful, especially with the highlighted AG. Yeah, now I'm worried about that. You, but you can't tell me what it is. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> There's also there was also something I think about us just getting in the room and enjoying ourselves again. Yeah. You know, after that prolonged period of time, and there's something really kind of uh, that thing of jumping in the room together again and seeing what happens that was just so kind of incredibly uplifting for me. Like it was just great to find that spot that I know is like a kind of safe space if you know what I mean. Yeah, and it's, it you know. says, I think it says something about the way me and you approach music. The diff, uh, this is something that goes back to that question about what we each see in each other. And, and for me, I, I'm much more pessimistic in regard to our music than you are. You're, you, you seem to be, at least, generally beautifully enthusiastic about um, the stuff that we do uh, the way I look at it is that you can see further down the line of of the potential of something better than I can. I only see potential yeah. even in the yeah. even in the bad stuff. Like I just yeah. hang on to potential because it takes it's just the slightest little thing that can move me really deeply that I'll grab onto yeah. until you sort of beat me around the head and go like it's just not working. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna um give you one here, as you did with Grinder Man too. Would Warren and yourself throw carnage at the remix community as, quite frankly, Hand of God is crying out for a deep rave remix? That's Daniel and Natalie Thackray. I mean, why not? Yeah. You know, I think at the time when we did those remixes, I just wasn't sure if everybody was doing that kind of idea just because that's what you did. You know, there's, there's always this rush to do stuff because everybody's doing it. Yeah. And it took me a while to actually to go back and listen to it and realize there was something really fabulous about that remix project that people were just ripping stuff unceremoniously and, you know, just like kind of taking what they wanted from it and, and making something out of it. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. The Nick Zinner version of, yeah. of, um, you know, ooh, come on, be what's that one? Get out of the cold. Yeah, that one. That one's awesome. You know, like, a, a, and and I mean, why not? I, we should throw it at, right. at the kind. Let's do that. What was the inspiration for the song "Hand of God," Joe Samain? I mean, that that actually was a Tommy sent me. Actually, was when we we're going to do demos with Tommy. And Tommy beautifully would send me like, you know, a video of him playing drums, sometimes a couple a day, sometimes one a week, just this like, okay, in four, and play a drum pattern and stuff like that. And I'd send them on to you. They're really beautiful. And one of those beats I got. 
and kind of looped it up and messed around with it and then just threw a bunch of sounds and stuff like that from scores and that that we hadn't used and then sent it to you and we got in the studio and started messing around with it. Yeah. I care less about form and that's the thing that you really push me towards is finding some form because I have no association really with structure in a way like I've worked my way towards it but I don't really care for structure whereas you write with a yeah totally it's it's a it's a narrative it's a narrative thing and a god coming from the sky gonna swim to the middle and stay out there a while Cast a spell on me. Let the river cast a spell on me. I'm not sure if that's everything. If we basically answered everyone's questions. Warren, you did well. Always nice to have a catch up uh, chat. It's lovely to talk to you. Yeah, lovely to catch up. We, I don't think we've ever talked about a record together before. I learned a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> we should make another one. We should make another one, yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye, Nick. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I love you too, Nick. Sometimes she's laughing and sometimes she's crying and sometimes the moon is a talking to nobody. And there's a madness in her and the madness in me and together it forms a kind of sanity. Oh baby, don't leave me. the hills with the moon in our eyes we bought a house in the country where we could lose our minds the moon is a girl with tears in her eyes who has thrown her bags in the back of the car and I'm not even remotely surprised. She's waving goodbye, she's waving goodbye. Well, the moon is a girl.